I want to introduce our panel, Dr. Lucinda Bateman, Dr. Braden Yalman, Dr. Suzanne Vernon, and Angela Linford and Tai Rushone, who are not doctors, but they have stayed at a Holiday Inn recently, so they probably qualify. Anyway, glad, glad to have this group together. We want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, events over the past year. I'm going to start right out by uh, asking Dr. Bateman. Uh, the Bateman Horn Center made a decision last year to specifically observe and treat a group of individuals who were involved with COVID, long COVID. Let me just ask you to share a little bit about uh, what we attempted to do there and what we have learned from this <clears throat> long COVID research. What, what implications does that have for individuals with ME-CFS and fibromyalgia? Thank you, Rob. I'm happy to do that. Uh, we were very strategic in our decision to evaluate long COVID patients. And first and foremost, we didn't want to uh, shift our resources away from patients with ME-CFS and related conditions, but we had a very uh, clear view that uh, COVID was going to leave many people sick with the post-viral syndrome. So uh, thanks to um, many um, kind of unexpected resources, um, we were able to um, do uh, create a plan and hire two new providers <coughs> that we trained specifically to recognize, diagnose, and stay up to date on long COVID. Um, that not only, <coughs> sorry for my dry cough, not only gave me a chance to learn vicariously about long COVID by supervising and, and teaching and working with our new clinicians, um, but it trained those clinicians uh, in an amazing way. Um, and uh, their work with long COVID has prepared them completely to be able to see patients with ME-CFS, POTS, and fibromyalgia. So now they're a very critical and important part of our staff, and we've integrated um, long COVID patients in alongside us. And it's been a great opportunity, um, and I think it's going to benefit everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bateman. Uh, Dr. Yellman or Dr. Vernon, do you have any follow-up uh, observations about that decision for the Bateman Horn Center to take that route? Starting with Dr. Yellman. Yeah, you know, it's um, I, I see the involvement with long COVID as a uh, actual additive to all of those with ME-CFS, because really what we seem to be dealing with in most cases of long COVID, and of course there are exceptions that are specific to that virus, but what we're really seeing is the early stages of onset of ME-CFS. So we're learning about what is happening in those early stages that could be defining or or really be the start of this cascade of, of secondary complications and tertiary complications that become what people with longstanding ME-CFS are experiencing. So in some senses, we're learning more about the illness in ways we never have before. It was so hard to identify people early in the illness. And, and also it's brought national attention to ME-CFS. We, we, one of the things that we and, and many advocacy groups have been working on is trying to help other scientists and clinicians understand the connections between the two and that long COVID is the COVID triggered flavor of ME-CFS, but that ME-CFS itself is where the work needs to be, that the research needs to be not specifically on the COVID virus, although that's important, of course, for acute infections, hospitalizations, et cetera, but not through a virology perspective necessarily, but from a whole multi-system illness perspective, that that's where we're gonna start shifting our money, our research. Um, and also I think it's been a fertile ground for people to start accepting others when they come in and say, I have ME-CFS. When you're in the emergency room, uh, that people are like, oh, I've actually heard of this now. And maybe, maybe this is actually something I need to learn more about or at least listen to my patients. So. We've gotten better at that through our work with long COVID. And I think the research we've done supports the connections between those illnesses um, and is really forwarding uh, all of the work that needs to be done for those with ME-CFS, fibro, and long COVID. Thanks, Dr. Yellman. Dr. Vernon, your thoughts? Um, um, here, here, to what Dr. Yellman just said. Um, 
this is really a generational opportunity. You know, as a scientist, I'm going to put my geek hat on and it's like, um, you know, how can we turn a pandemic that's just been horrific, traumatic, horrible into something positive? And, um, and really it's just created this hopefully for us once in a lifetime opportunity to understand um, post viral illness. As we know, so many people with MECFS started, um, their illness started with some kind of infection that they didn't recover from. And, and now, as Dr. Yeoman said, you know, the, the world's attention is now on um, why people are not recovering from um, infection with um, SARS-CoV-2. And that is just putting a lot of attention on Bateman Horn Center because we're one of the handful of experts in the world that understands MECFS and understands post viral illness. And I, I think it's just gonna be an incredible opportunity to benefit not only the people that have long COVID, but um, our, our MECFS and fibro patients that started the same way or a similar way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Berman. So uh, back to Dr. Bateman, you know, we experienced and continue to experience questions from individuals who have suffered for years and years and years with MECFS and were concerned uh, about us turning our attention to long COVID. Uh, and overshadowing potentially the needs of making progress. What would you say to these folks? I would say that um, I had that fear a little bit initially in the beginning, but once we got going, uh, it became more and more clear that um, this is just an increase in our own fold and that everything we learn from long COVID research is going to help uh, people with MECFS and, and related conditions. And um, <clears throat> that's true. Uh, in spades when it comes to research and clinical care. Um, I have just become more and more uh, convinced of how important it is. And also the government, of course, our federal government, but also governments around the world are pouring money into research to try to understand the long-term consequences of COVID. And um, it is not lost on me. They're asking the very same questions that we've been asking for 30 years. And um, the, the great thing is the critical mass of people asking those questions, where they come from and how well they're funded is now entirely different. And I will say those same people are understanding the relationship between uh, COVID and previous uh, post-viral syndromes and it's heightened their awareness. Thank you. Dr. Yeoman, uh, Dr. Bateman mentioned the coexisting conditions. What have you learned uh, about the role that coexisting conditions can have on an individual's disease severity. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting even to call them coexisting conditions. I think of it as sort of different manifestations of the underlying illness and, and certain, you know, uh, symptomatologies that at any time in the course of an illness tend to be the driving factor that's making all the other ones worse. And, and it's really where I think the art of medicine comes in for us as clinicians is to figure out among, you know, 100 different symptoms, even breaking those down into major categories, whether it be mast cell activation, craniocervical instability, hypermobility, orthostatic intolerance, sympathetic overdrive. Even when you break those symptoms down into those categories, you can still struggle to know which one is driving any given symptom of headaches or of vertigo uh, or pain. Um, and so it's, they are not in separate silos. They all interact with one another. They all make one another worse. And so somebody can present with, you know, worsening of all of their symptoms and trying to figure out, is that because their mast cell was triggered? Is that because they're in post-exertional malaise? Is that because their sympathetic overdrive is worse? Is that because they have a slight shift in their anatomy with craniocervical instability that's making them not respond to medicines they were responding before. Um, trying to tie those together and think about them as a whole rather than as separate subspecialties is, is really the, the challenge we all face and something that I think we've gotten better at uh, of thinking about 
what is driving what and how do we go for that low hanging fruit to really improve everything. I, you know, for a long time, the only tools we had were symptomatic treatments. You know, if sleep is bad, if pain is bad, give a bandaid for it, right. And help improve quality of life. But I think now we're at a point where we understand why the bandaid is needed and we're trying to learn how to, to reverse or heal those wounds in the first place. So for me, it's been incredibly exciting um, to practice medicine under those terms and really then take what I've learned and try to share that with others. Thank you. So Dr. Bateman, you've been in this arena for a long time and you experienced things going way back to your days at Johns Hopkins and through the University of Utah. What have you seen shift in the world of clinical care and education regarding receptiveness of your colleagues? That's interesting because <clears throat> I've said many a time, I don't claim my kind which uh, other, other physicians in the field. And once we made buttons uh, as part of our campaigns and the, and the button that I liked the best was a quote from me and it said, infiltrate academia. <laughs> and um, so, you know, uh, it, it was very difficult to get the attention of major institutions like my alma mater, Johns Hopkins and other places, but things have really changed. Uh, they changed uh, over time, and it's been catapulted forward uh, with long COVID. And I may have mentioned this previously, but um, I'm part of a, an effort outside of BHC. Um, it's a CDC-funded um, monthly webinar, webinar-style echo learning a session for primary care physicians. And uh, this, the goal, it's called Long COVID and Fatiguing Illness Recovery Program. And the goal uh, of this is to target primary care providers with um, information and best practices for post-acute sequela of COVID or long COVID and myalgic encephalomyelitis chronic fatigue syndrome or MECFS. And there are uh, 20 um, amazing faculty members as part of this effort from institutions all over the US who previously did not have expertise in MECFS, I would say 75% of them who come in with their long COVID expertise who are now experts in MECFS and part of this lecture series. So that's just an example of how important it is. I, I just wanted to say also that I got a ding in my email yesterday from uh, Hippocrates, which is a, an online uh, a clinical decision tool for clinicians and uh, one of the most utilized online medical reference services. Uh, and, and it said they had a, an algorithm for long COVID. So I thought, yeah, well, I'll follow that and see if they even care about MECFS, right? I mean, there are more than a million prescriber, uh, subscribers for that. I looked it up on Wikipedia in 2010, and I'm sure it's at least double that now. I went through the algorithm and the first one I came to was when I clicked on the fatigue of long COVID was a reference to MECFS saying with all the case definition and describing post-exertional malaise. And um, the, whole, the whole tool included an integrative discussion of other post-viral syndromes, including MECFS. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> there's a change, a <laughs> big change. That's awesome. And I love the phrase, you know, infiltrate academia. We are committed to doing that. And as you'll hear in this ongoing conversation, we're making great strides in provider education. But before we leave that, another arena that has to be infiltrated uh, in funding and practice is, is research. And Cindy, you talked a little bit about uh, the Recover concept and program. Let me ask Dr. Vernon to just weigh in for a few minutes about what she sees on the horizon in current what we're doing and in other places, what we hope to be able to accomplish related to research in the future. So um, I think that was, you wanted me to talk a little bit about Recover? Yeah, just to continue that conversation and then what other things would you hope to see in play? So um, Recover is a, um, an initiative that was spearheaded is spear, being spearheaded by the, the National Institutes of Health. And there are several hundred um, scientists and tens of centers involved in the whole design. It's really called the collaborative design um, to uh, the whole recover initiative. 
and included in that design are also patients. And then patients, there will be tens of thousands of patients enrolled in Recover. And, and uh, the, the whole basis for the Recover initiative is to learn about the long-term effects of COVID. Why do some people get better? Why do some people not get better? And um, you know, what can be done um, through the whole course of that disease? And I mean, it's been really a, a quite a stunning effort that was started last year and enrollment is now underway and it'll go on for five years. So it is essentially a, and probably beyond, it is a, it is a, a study that is really trying to understand the natural course of disease, the natural course of recovery or not recovering um, following infection. So it's, it's, I think, very, very important. There's already been additional funding put into the initiative um, for um, additional types of research that was put out to the, to the broader um, research community, not just the, those that are involved in Recover. And they recently also just um, put out additional funding for treatment trials, which they intend to get started. Um, this is ambitious in the third or fourth quarter of this year. Um, so it's really just, um, it's, it's just mind boggling how fast everything is moving. We are um, part of the, Re the Bateman Horn Center is part of the Recover Initiative. We are a recruiting center for um, the Mountain States Pass Consortium, which is um, led by the University of Utah, Dr. Rachel Hess, and the University of Colorado, and the University of New Mexico, and Intermountain Health. So it's a very large consortium, which falls under the Mountain States Pass Consortium. And we are working in the adult cohort. Um, there's also a pediatric, I should say, a pediatric and a pregnancy cohort that's part of the Mountain Six Pass Consortium. Um, and we've also, um, we are in the process of submitting clinical trials to the Recover Initiative, um, which I think is very exciting, as well as very specific um, research projects that are looking at genetics and trying to understand um, genetic fact factors associated with long COVID and not recovering. Um, thank you for that insight. I'm going to jump right now and talk a little bit with uh, Talia Ruscione about our education program. And so Talia, a little bit about what has changed and where we're headed with our provider education. You know, I've been with Bateman Horn for is this my third year? No, two years now? Maybe three. I can't do math. And um, so much has changed in that short period of time. Um, and I do think that in large part, um, the pandemic has certainly helped us create a platform where um, it's hard to dismiss post-viral education and the need um, of providers, no matter what specialty or care field they are in to understand that and be able to meet patients where they're at. Um, and really it's just taking the, the blueprint of what we know with MECFS and teaching providers that they are seeing this, that they have been seeing this and trying to meet them in their, in their field where they're at and seeing patients and giving them the tools to be able to do that effectively. Um, this next year, well, this year in particular, um, we've gained a ton of momentum. So all the seeds that we've been planting for the last couple of years are really starting to take off um, with a lot of different uh, medical education programs, continuing medical education, um, using institutions and academia to really launch that platform and reach more providers. Um, as you guys have probably seen by now, we're becoming, um, we're kind of transitioning into becoming more of a training center as well. We have residents coming through and fellows. Um, and I think that each one of those people reach, no matter how small or large, is an opportunity and synapse for change. So I think we're, we're really starting to take off. Thanks, Talia. And um, 
lest you forget, you're on just about to your third anniversary in June of 2019, and you and Angela are two of the greatest asset hires we've had in forever. I mean, you've done an amazing job in those three years, and we deeply appreciate it. One of the things that you recently launched uh, specifically to assist providers, but also our patients and um, our, our, our friends in the community was your crash survival guide. Talk a little bit about the feedback on that and, and uh, what was your inspiration for that? Well, um, you know, it's, I think MECFS, fibromyalgia, long COVID, all of these chronic illnesses have their own monster as Amy so poetically, you know, shared with us today. And the biggest struggle that I see with patients with MECFS and long COVID is that PEM, that push crash cycle. And I think most of you know by now that um, my sister was my inspiration for this. And then I just watched her in this constant tug of war. Um, and every time she would crash, she would just get sicker and sicker. And I think that that is, I kept stepping back and saying, what is the one thing that if patients could gain some control back from this disease, what would it be? And it would be controlling that push crash cycle and trying to stay out of PEM. So um, myself and a wonderful, amazing group of interdisciplinary professionals joined me in creating this guidebook, which um, really just kind of takes patients and hopefully their care partner, as well as providers through different aspects of um, staying out of PEM, really understanding what that is um, and trying to implement some of those changes. I think one of the biggest things that we can do as a center is give both patients and providers and their care partners tools to help support them in their care. Thank you, Talia. We've got some exciting things on the horizon. Individuals who are on this call who have been great partners in helping us move some of this education forward and partners yet to be announced that uh, helping us really unfold some new uh, horizons and great advancements in provider education. And we appreciate all you've done with that. Angela, who is our communications director, uh, plays a pivotal role in helping communicate all that we learn in our, in our clinic, in our research, uh, and, uh, and, and to promote the things that will help individuals understand where to get information and how important it is for providers to grasp this, as well as our donor base. So Angela, talk a little bit about your communication and marketing role in moving our mission forward and what, what you're doing to help increase overall awareness. Uh, thanks, Rob. So I'm fortunate that, um, I mean, as you know, we have some really great educational materials that are developed and content that we have. And so then my challenge is, is to disseminate that to as many people as we possibly can. And, um, but you know, we're a nonprofit and so we're on a budget. So it's a matter of leveraging and figuring out how to spread that information through social media, through professional organizations, through any kind of networking that we can do. And of course, all of you on here are a big part of that because you get the information and you take it and you share it with other people. And in that way, it just continues to grow and grow and grow. And we're really grateful that um, individuals and providers from all over the world access our education. And we want to, one of the things that we're um, looking at doing is providing more uh, translations for some of this work for patients in other countries and making things more accessible for um, the members of our community who struggle to, or who are unable to look at screens or videos or view things that way. Um, so that's something that I um, have a challenge for myself to do is to figure out a way to disseminate that, um, to make it more accessible for everyone that we possibly can within our community. And, oh yeah, so we've got a question in here. How can we access the manual? I was gonna mention that. Mm -hmm. So the MECFS crash guide, it is on our website, which is batemanhorncenter.org. And right on the home page, there's at the top um, in red, you'll see the word new. And then it says, I think it says new guidebook um, and click on that. And that'll take you to the, um, to the guidebook and tell you put, the link in the chat. And then I also wanna call out that um, hopefully you've all received the email that Dr. Bateman 
is speaking at um, a provider education event tomorrow. It's one of the ones that she talked about, the one that's funded by the CDC, and it's open to the public, these monthly sessions, and they've asked her to speak in honor of Awareness Day. So that'll be at one o'clock mountain time, and it's on our website, on our event calendar, and hopefully you've gotten the email um, reminders for that. So thanks, Rob. Thank you, Angela, uh, for all you do. So in the last minute or two of the panel time, I just wanna ask the entire panel if anyone has any other ahas uh, to your respective work that uh, surfaced for you in this past year that we haven't touched on. I don't think so. There's a lot um, and I'm really, uh, I, I've tried to move through the overwhelmed stage to the embrace the new challenges stage. <laughs> I think that, I mean, the, the biggest aha for me is like just the incredible attention that and awareness that the pandemic is bringing to um, the diseases that we've been studying or in, and trying to help people with our entire careers. I mean, it's just been, just been mind blowing. Thank you. And thank you to the just, panel for your like, insights. Was there somebody else? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the chatty one. Uh, I just wanted to conclude by saying that, you know, each one of you guys play a huge role in the work that we do, not just from the communication aspect, but we learn from you every day. And hearing from you and the research that uh, you engage in, the clinical care, the education, everything, we learn that from you. So you are just as much a part of this as we are. Thanks, Daya. Uh, 